Good morning, Glad Tidings. It's great to see all of you again uh, yesterday, also at Visioning Weekend on Saturday and also today on Sunday. I just want to start off with uh, uh, um, saying that I was just so encouraged. I know a lot of us may have seen like little girl here, but just reminding me that, you know, even as I was praising, I see the girl, uh, she's queen, right, next to Yota, her she just wants to be with her father. Yeah, and, and that is what we are like. I think when we are worshipping, are we really like desiring to be with our father? Yeah, we just want to be so close to our father. We don't want to leave our father. And, um, and that is really something that reflects our heart of worship unto God. Even as we enthrone Jesus through prayer and praise, you know, um, uh, I just want to affirm that our, you know, like we, we have different ones at different life stages who serve, continue to serve the Lord. And sometimes we see little kids up here. I remember my own when I was at youth, um, when I was still pastoring at the youth service, um, I strapped the baby to, my, to me and preach. And then as they grow older, they were jumping off the, the stage. Now that was like what it's like to serve the Lord. Uh, I believe that all of us can can affirm that, you know, even at every life stage, we are to serve the Lord. Uh, and, and just want to affirm our brother, <laughs> uh, because it's hard to, to focus yeah, and have a kid. But, you know, that is, that is enough for God. Yeah, our service um, to Him. Um, and today, even as we come alongside uh, uh, together as a church envisioning weekend. Um, I really appreciate uh, yesterday those who, those who came, who come alongside to pray together as a church to listen to where we are heading together. Um, and for the f benefit of those who were not uh, able to be here uh, last, uh, to yesterday, I'll be giving a little summary um, as to what I shared from Nehemiah 3. Um, and I, as I continue today into Nehemiah 4. Uh, now, a little funny thing that I read uh, as I was preparing this sermon was that uh, there's a riddle. Say, uh, do you know why Nehemiah might be the shortest man in the Bible? Why? Very fast. I <laughs> think Helen, he, you read all the riddles of for Bible. Uh, uh, she say, because he's only knee high, Maya. Yes. Okay, no offense to anyone whose name is Nehemiah here. <laughs> um, so uh, last yesterday, even as we uh, went into understanding Nehemiah, what it was about, uh, Nehemiah is a book uh, in which we read that there's the rebuilding of the ruins of the walls uh, in Jerusalem at the time where people Israelites were returning from their Babylonian captivity. They were returning to the city, and the temple had already been rebuilt as we read uh, in the book of Ezra. Uh, and now, at this point in history, Israel history, Nehemiah was deeply moved and burdened, as we read in chapter 1, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And therefore, he asked the Persian king. Uh, he was a cupbearer to this king, and so he asked him, in fear and trembling, can I go back and rebuild the walls? And even though the Persian king is not uh, it does not be that it doesn't follow the the God of Israel, but yet he was given the go ahead, and we read we read in Nehemiah chapter three. Uh, I observe these two points that I expounded on yesterday. I'm just gonna give us a brief summary. The first point I made was that the priests and the leaders modeled the rebuilding. So worship to God is prioritized. We read that the high priests were the ones that started first. Um, and they rebuilt the sheep gate, which re-established the worship unto God. So yesterday we acknowledged the leaders and their roles in the church, taking up the responsibility to lead in different parts of the church. We honoured pastors, elders, ministry heads, deacons. And actually there are so many more of you who are leaders uh, whether in the youth or the children as kids, teachers, um, and, and also in the CG ministries uh, and silver. And you know, the leaders, they teach us to prioritize the worship of God uh, through them serving and their leadership, always pointing us to Jesus. Now, secondly, the rebuilding was done not only by leaders of the community, but by every committed person in the community. 
I shared yesterday that it was a shift in Israel's history from one faithful leader leading wayward people to all to suddenly all of them at, the, at this point in history that all the people started to step up to do their part under the leadership of Nehemiah. It was a foreshadowing of when the Holy Spirit would be given to all believers. You know, after Jesus died and rose again, we know that the Holy Spirit has given, been given to all of us. And it's no longer just a select few that are called to be priests. We are all then now called to be priests, members of the body of Christ, all of, all of us called to build the body up and serve one another. It, it was a shift from the physical temple housing the Spirit of God to each of us now inhabiting the Spirit and each of us a temple making God's invisible presence visible to the world. So there's this shift uh, toward what we, we, were, we know has happened in Acts and even now where each of us are called to be a priest and all of us are to put our hands to the plow. The principle of Nehemiah 3 is that the ministry of God must be done by the whole people of God. And today, even as I start out on Nehemiah 4, I'm going to highlight two more principles when it comes to doing God's work. So um, I'm going to let us uh, hear the entire chapter being read to us before I continue. Four. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor, the officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. And then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. 
So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. I love this reading. So apparently this is the dramatized reading of the Nehemiah 4. Uh, I believe that um, it's, uh, as you hear the, all the 23 verses, uh, you get what is happening at this point. Um, and I would like to just uh, make the first point uh, even as we rebuild. Today, my, the sermon is when we rebuild the title. Uh, and I'm going to give us two principles uh, that come from this, this chapter. The first is when we rebuild, we must expect and prepare for opposition. In chapter 4, the rebuilding we saw, the opposition were from the enemies, Sanballat, a Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, Geshem, the Arab, and their people. All three peoples were leaders of anti-Jewish groups, regions, and uh, these people adjacent to Judah and Jerusalem. And they were fearful of the growing influence of the Jews. And they despised the Jews and insulted them in their work, as you heard uh, in the first few verses, saying that they were weak, that they were, what they were rebuilding were lousy. You know, something fine on each other for everything, you know, trying to say and uh, uh, insult them and t telling them that why would they even think that they can rebuild, they can even do this impossible thing. But despite the opposition, the people work with all their heart. But we hear also we read that the opposition, got, the opposition got worse. It became a physical threat that they would, the enemies would come and kill them. And it intensified. We read that they were told repeatedly, ten times over, that wherever you turn, you will be attacked. So here they experienced the attacks of the enemy through insults about who they are as God's people and insulting what they can do, causing them to doubt their identity and the work that God had called them to do. When they were insulted and looked down upon, it affected them. We hear that they were saying, our strength is giving out. I think there's so much rubber, we cannot, we cannot rebuild already. The enemy attacks made them focus on their limitations, got them very discouraged and weary and wanting to stop their work, wanting to stop obeying God. The second threat or enemy, the attack of the enemy, came through intensified threats of being attacked and harmed causing them to be afraid. The enemies kept whispering to them and keep telling them that you're going to be attacked. But Nehemiah, as we know, um, he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. In the same way, as believers in the kingdom of God, we have an adversary, Satan, whose purpose is to prevent God's people or all people from experiencing God's love, knowing Jesus, trusting Jesus, and obeying God. The Bible tells us who Satan is. If we read from the various verses, and there are more, we know that he's a murderer, he's a liar, the father of lies, he's like a prowling lion waiting to devour someone um, who does, is not alert, um, and a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy lives. And we also read that with his, well, because um, what Satan can do, because he's a deceiver, is that he can use things like even signs and wonders that serve the lie, his lies, to deceive those who are, um, who are distracted or eyes are turned away from God or those who don't know Jesus. And as believers, we take two un as believers, we can take two unhealthy approaches to knowing that we have an enemy. 
So let me tell this story. A little girl was once disciplined by her mother for kicking her little brother in the shins and then pulling his hair. You know, and this happens a lot uh, in my house also. <laughs> okay, uh, you, have, you have siblings, right? everyone who has siblings or, or knows kids, you know that they, they fight, right? And then the mother said, Sally, why did you let the devil make you kick your brother and pull his hair? She said, the devil made me kick him, but pulling his hair was my idea. So I like this story because the mother's reaction shows us that we can have an unhealthy blame even or obsession with evil and the enemy. And we start to live in fear or see everything as a spiritual attack. We keep using the devil as an excuse, a person to blame when we disobey and sin against God. The devil made me do it. Okay, but the little girl is more discerning. Sometimes it's the temptation of the devil but there is also the lure of our own desires, sinful desires that we need to be clear about and not be deceived about our own weakness to fall into sin. It is this kind of awareness that keeps us dependent on Jesus. So, for example, when we make a choice to gossip, complain and grumble, we don't blame it on the devil. If we make a choice to scroll endlessly on our phones and get sucked into Wow, this person's life, I envy, I envy. We make a choice, or when we make a choice to click on some unwholesome content on the internet, or when we choose to take part in unholy relationships, or when we choose to keep unforgiveness in our hearts, or when we choose to lie, sure, maybe there have been a trap set by Satan, but it's also our choice that we chose to follow our heart's deceptive desires, that we sometimes and many times underestimate. So that is one extreme to have an unhealthy obsession with evil and blame on Satan. On the other extreme of everything is Satan's doing, we do not believe. The other extreme is we may say, no lah, the enemy is not real. The world would like to believe that, you know, Everything that is not right in this world is just human choice. We didn't choose to be good. We didn't, that's, you know, it's just a choice thing. And evil is just a man-made concept. But we know as believers, Satan is not imaginary. The world does not want to believe that there is an ultimate enemy who is against God and against whoever who follows God. You know, yesterday, we talked about raiding ourselves as an end-time church. We're readying ourselves for the second coming of Jesus. So an end time ready church needs to be aware of the schemes of the enemy and learn to stand up against it. We should not be afraid of the enemy, nor should we um, disbelieve what the, what the Bible says about Satan. Hebrews 2.14 tells us this, since the children have flesh and blood, we too, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, Jesus, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who their, all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The Bible tells us that we do not need to be afraid because Jesus has already crushed the enemy under his feet. Satan is already defeated. He no longer holds the power of death and condemnation over us. And for a season before Jesus comes again, we must still remember that the enemy can still strike and wound us and poison our relationships when we succumb to his attacks. An illustration is the rattlesnake. Now, we live in Singapore, so we don't really know or see snakes, okay? But um, I read that hospitals like in the, in the US, especially in the places like Phoenix, Arizona, they have a lot of rattlesnakes. So they have a lot of bites, um, patients who come in because of rattlesnake bites. And, um, and the ones that they discover is that many of them come in with a bite from a rattlesnake thought to be dead. Sometimes the snakes were short 
and their heads were cut off, but the snake head can still retain a reflex motion. And one study showed that the snake heads can make striking type motions and still bite people up to one hour after decapitation. That's very long, right? Yeah. So imagine that in the same way we have an enemy who is defeated but still can attack us. Yet the Bible tells us, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist him standing firm in faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So in, when we read that Nehemiah, the man, he told them, be equipped with spears, shields, bows and armour. For each of us, we need to take up our place as a son and daughter of God, God the Father. We read in Ephesians 6, take up the armour of God. Put it on. Resist the devil and the temptation of our own flesh. So Nehemiah 4.15 says, back to the story, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. When we are aware of the devil's schemes and our own tendencies to sin and be tempted, then we can bring it to God and God will frustrate the enemy's scheme. We are then able to return to the work of the kingdom. If not, we will be too busy dealing with division, with broken relationships, with lack of resources, with people who have given into the insults and lies of the enemy. If Satan can keep us distracted, we will leave the work of teaching God's truth, discipling others, and sharing the gospel undone. Like Nehemiah reminds the people, remember our God who is great and awesome. Remember our God who is greater than the devil. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, each one of you who say, I believe and put my trust in Jesus. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So just like in Nehemiah, when we rebuild, when we are coming closer to God, when we say, Lord, I commit to you and we, I want to obey you, remember, expect and prepare for opposition. So that's our first principle. But yet you know, even as you expect and prepare for opposition, you are not crushed nor defeated. You have a sure help in our Lord Jesus. The second principle is when we rebuild, we must pray with God dependence and act in faith. When Nehemiah knew what the enemies were saying to the Israelites, he prayed for justice to be done. We read his prayer, right? And, and when they knew about the threat of attack, they posted a guard day and night. We read that they prayed and they posted a guard. When the people prayed, they also acted. They prayed and posted a guard. They trusted God will hear their prayer and will protect them, but they knew they also had a responsibility over defending themselves. Here we learn a key theological principle we see in the rest of Scripture too. That God is sovereign over all things. He's completely in charge. Yet, He also wants us to be responsible over our actions as those actions show that we are aligned with God. No, when we pray, we don't, it's, it doesn't remove our responsibility of stewarding what God has given us. It does not take away our responsibility that we are partnering with God in His kingdom work. And when we, fulfill, when we work alongside God in obedience to fulfill His mission, it's an act of faith that aligns with our prayer that God will make His purposes come to pass. So praying does not mean, oh, I gave the problem to God already and I do nothing about it. It also doesn't mean that you do something, if you do something, you don't have faith. The people did both. They prayed and they did something in alignment with their prayer. It is a mystery as to how these two beliefs work. God is in control. Ultimately, He's sovereign, yet we are also responsible for our actions. So they are try to un help us understand this somewhat. So God's sovereignty and human responsibility coexisting is possible 
Because God allowed free will. All of us are responsible to God for our actions, choices, decisions, thoughts and desires. So sin is man's doing, even though God is in control. So for example, God has given each of us a body. Your body is given to you. It comes with genetics that we got from our father and mother. God is ultimately in control of when we are born and when we die. But we are still responsible of how we take care of our health and how we want to live. Knowing God is ultimately in control shows that we are limited because we do not know what would happen. And so we pray because prayer proves that we need God. We depend on God because we simply don't know a lot. But if we pray knowing God is in control, we are assured God is working out good purposes for us. And even if we make a mess of things, there's always hope. On the other hand, if we think everything is fated, so means, you know, doesn't matter how we live, things will still just pan out the same way because God already intended it. Then we won't care to pray and we won't care to act in obedience to God either. So when we pray and, and take responsibility for what we can humanly do, we acknowledge that God has made us co-agents with Him. He calls us to effect His kingdom in the world. He, asks, he calls us to do this because as we pray, we grow in our dependence on Him. And as we act, we also grow in our trust in Him. So marriage and parenting is a great example of how we pray and depend on God's sovereignty, yet also act in obedience and trust. So I was thinking of many, many things that how do I um, pray with faith and yet also make sure I, have, I do my human responsibility. So many of my prayers revolve around family, my family. My desire, and I also know that it's God's desire, is that my husband Colin and I will be united and committed in love. Like this year is our 12th year of marriage. Repres and our desire is that in our marriage, we will represent how Jesus loves the church. So when I pray, I pray, God, in this marriage, I want to stay in love. I want to learn to submit to each other. I want us to practice grace and forgiveness. And Lord, let nothing dry us apart. God, fight for us also. But I am not absolved. I'm, I'm not saying that, oh, I pray all this to God about my marriage and then don't do anything about it. What is my responsibility as a wife? I will need to do something in order to get my marriage going as well. And as I do these things that I believe will sow into the marriage, I also pray. So God keeps me committed to my action when I pray. And God keeps the godly desire going as I pray. God keeps me submitted to Him in this charge that He has given to me and Colin in the marriage. So we must remember that as we pray, we depend on God. We also have a responsibility. God is completely in charge. But it matters what we do too. Think about Jesus. Acts 2.23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. So here, this verse tells us that God determined that Jesus will be sent and he will die. That is God's sovereignty. His sovereign will is that he will send Jesus and he will come and he will die. But did God make people crucify Jesus? No. Those who crucified Jesus will still be responsible for their actions. So you have on one hand God's sovereignty, you have on one hand human responsibility. Think of them as stems on the ladder. 
They are connected and necessary for us to learn to depend on God. When we pray, we stand on the rung that connects the two. We understand that prayer is not passive. It is an active trust that God is sovereign, that I can trust His very good will because He's a very good God. He's a God that doesn't change. That over the history of humanity, He's proved Himself to be faithful to us. And in that sovereignty, we also believe, oh, we have a readiness to act upon that trust in God. However, the fact is that many of us make prayer the least of our priorities. What that means is we trust, we go over to that side on human responsibility. We think, we just do whatever we can. We work, we trust our work very much. Because we know our work will produce things, things that are tangible. And soon enough, if we keep going on human responsibility, then we will decide, oh, we actually maybe no need to pray until I really, really bad jalat. Okay, and maybe at this point, if we go to this side, we will believe that we are saved by our works. And we are very, very inclined to think this way because we are Singaporeans. You know, Singaporeans, right, uh, we love to work. I mean, I don't think we love, lah, but we have to work. Okay, but, and, and we work very, very hard. Um, because... You know, the narrative of our nation is Singapore became successful because of the hard work that we've put in. People believe that to, for us to be successful, Singapore mentality form a fire plan. Okay? Solve the problem. Have some practical solution. Make sure you have KPI and meet the outcomes. Right? Uh, that, is hum that is our work. This is the way we work. Even our Asian parents have instilled this work ethic in us. Work hard. Work hard, work hard, work hard. If you've got a problem, work hard first. Okay, so that is, we, are, we are, can be very responsible. Yeah? And, but then that ethic and that culture in us can go against the very, the very thing that God wants for us. It goes against the prayerfulness that God wants to cultivate in each of us. And when we are at here, this point in GTC, where we say, enthrone Jesus through prayer and praise, we are raiding ourselves for this new season, where we are raiding ourselves for the second coming of Jesus, ready to receive new family. The way that we are ready will be through our prayer, being united in prayer. We need to enthrone Jesus as Lord through growing in our prayer life. To grow strong and healthy as a church, ready for God's coming, Jesus' coming, and new family to join us, we can no longer just individually pray um, here and there, don't prioritize prayer. We must increase in our prayer life. We must we must experience and encounter God that the place of prayer is where we nourish our faith, our relationship with God. And it is there that He will bring transformation in our lives. For each of us, even yesterday, I was telling, sharing that even as we move forward with different initiatives, we can't, next week when we pray, you know, when our Friday prayer meeting starts again, we can't have only 20 people at prayer. We can't function as a church with only 30% of the church serving. We need all hands on deck to serve at the wall. We read that it's a guard and pray against the enemy 24-7. And that is what we read. The people never let down their guard. They prayed, they worked at the wall. Half of them guard the wall. They never, they never put their weapon down, even wherever they're going. They, they, when they left their post, the weapon was with them. In the same way, since we know that opposition is going to come when we obey the Lord, we must stay vigilant. We must keep the, the gaps plucked. We must take up our roles to watch, and watch what is happening in the world and strengthen ourselves in faith. We must pray with God dependence, knowing He is sovereign, when opposition comes. It's not if opposition comes, it's when. It will come. 
And all of us have to be prepared. But if we are not found in the place of prayer, if prayer is not our weapon, if, if we do not have the Word of God, then we will leave our post. The first principle is when we rebuild, we must expect and prepare for opposition. The second principle today, as I share, is when we rebuild, we must pray with God com- dependence and act in faith. Even as I end, I'm going to share um, J.I. Packer's quote about sovereignty of God and prayer. It's a bit long, but okay, I'm just going to read for you. It says, in prayer, you ask for things and give thanks for things. Why? Because you recognize God is the author and source of all the good you have had already and all the good that you hope for in the future. That is the fundamental philosophy of Christian prayer. The prayer of a Christian is not an attempt to force God's hand, but a humble acknowledgement of helplessness and dependence. When we are on our knees, we know it is not we who control the world. It is not in our power, therefore, to supply our needs by our own independent efforts. Every good thing that we desire for ourselves and for others must be sought from God and will come, if it comes at all, as a gift from His hands. In effect, therefore, what we do every time we pray is to confess our own impotence and God's sovereignty. It's to confess our own need that we cannot and God can. The very fact that a Christian prays is proof that he believes in the Lordship of his God. As a church, we say we want to enthrone Jesus. Jesus is Lord of my life. Jesus is Lord of the church. If Jesus is the center of our church, it must be shown in prayer dependence. If Jesus is the center of your lives, it must be shown in our prayer dependence. Prayer is the bedrock of our relationship with God. Nothing happens without prayer. Jesus retreated to pray before he did his ministry. That means that is something in that place of prayer that is so needful before we can be effective in ministry. Prayer is the privilege that God gives us to partner in His work in the world. Prayer is where we touch the heart of God and He touches ours. If we are committed to follow Jesus and enthrone Him, prayer is where we need to be. Today, I don't know, all of you, only you will know where you are at in your prayer life. Where you are at in your relationship with God. They are so linked. If someone asks you whether, how's your relationship with God? You can think also a lot about how is my prayer life? How is my prayer life? Because if we are not in the place of prayer, Jesus is not enthroned in our lives. And so today, even as we come together, we want to respond to the Lord. Because when we say, God, I come to you, it's, very, it's almost very simple. Like, how are you asking me to pray some more? Yeah, we, are, we want to grow in prayer. And that is the call today, that we want to grow in prayer. And so today, I, as I end, I have a very simple response time question to ask, right? Is will you commit to growing in your prayer life this year? Will you commit that as a church and as an individual, you will grow in your prayer life? And if you don't know how to, you have people to ask around you. And we, the people, community here, the leaders here are we all want to grow together. We all need to help one another in growing in this prayer life, in our prayer life with God. So I invite all of us to, to stand now okay, as we respond to God. Now the band is just going to play the music first and I would like us first to just take this time um, 
that as he prays, you and God, okay? Now, I'd just like us to close our eyes. Don't look around. Just um, help yourself to focus on God. Turn your eyes on, on, on Him, to Him. And just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, search me. And if your question, your answer to the question I've asked today, will you commit to growing in your prayer life? Will you commit to rebuilding the wall? Will you commit to enthroning Jesus? If your answer is yes, Lord, I want to grow in my prayer life. I want to experience you, encounter you in that place of prayer. And your, your, your answer is, Lord, help me. Help me to overcome the barriers. Help me to commit to my relationship with you in prayer. Now, if that is your prayer, okay, still eyes closed, no looking around, just you and the Lord. If that is you, that you want to grow in your prayer life, I'll just like you to put your hands up. Now, it's a response to God to say, Lord, in accordance to my faith, I also act. I lift up my hands to you to say yes. Yes, Lord. I want to grow in my prayer life. I commit God to do this, to prioritize the place of prayer because I know it's where I enthrone you. So I just ask us to for those who are responding to God, just keep your eyes closed, but your hands up as response to God. Yes, God, you see the hands that are raised. Lord, it is between you and each one here. Lord, you hear their hearts cry. You hear where they are at. And Lord, you are a good Father. You meet us where we are at. Lord, there, may there be no shame nor condemnation on where we are at now. Lord, you receive us just as we are. And you call us into that place of prayer. Because Lord, you know, Lord Father, that with you, we can face the world. That with you, we can do all things. That with you, we don't have to struggle alone. That with you, we don't have to depend on our hard work. That sometimes use nothing or little. But we know because with you, we have your grace. With you, we are found, oh God, carried carried by you when we can't walk anymore when we feel like there is nothing ahead when we feel like we don't know what to do anymore but with you God there is hope with you God we can depend on you we can rest and with you oh God we can be accepted and loved and fully known. Lord, all our deepest needs are met with you in that place of prayer. So Lord, I pray for each one here today, God. Would you meet them today? Lord, those who have said yes to you, God. God, would you meet them you encounter them, so into them. Pour, Lord, your love into them right now. Re Lord, make their resolve like steel. Their resolve to, to say, Lord, I want to be found in prayer with you. Lord, help them to act in alignment to their commitment today. So, Lord, I pray, Father. Lord, carry us today. Stir us. Stir the Holy Spirit in us up, Lord Father, that our minds and our hearts will keep turning, turning to you, 
keep turning to you in prayer when we are at work when we are walking when we are we are going to sleep when we are awake when we are doing various things our, our hearts and minds will always be turning to you praying unceasingly giving thanks to you noticing what you are doing and then giving thanks to you again lord this cycle will keep continuing oh lord will keep being experienced by your people here oh lord can we sing jesus be the center of our lives then we will sing jesus be the center of our church and let that be the prayer the prayer is not the the, the thing about today's message is not that i go home just wanting to pray but knowing that the prayer that why i want to pray is because of jesus jesus be the center and then we will pray jesus be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus 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 be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus Jesus, nothing else matters Nothing in this world Jesus, you're the center. Everything revolves around you. Jesus, you at the center of it all. I sing, Jesus, be the center of our church. Jesus, be the center of your church. Jesus, be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, be the center. Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee, and every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. Jesus. the center Jesus you're the center everything revolves around you Jesus you nothing else matters let's sing it to Jesus nothing in this world will do the center Jesus you're the center everything revolves around you Jesus you at the center of it all as we remain in the, the spirit of prayer I just said the Lord is leading us into a time of seeking Him personally and corporately. 
and through the time of consecration of five weeks, we sense the Lord has established the altar. And this altar is the corporate altars. And we need to bring ourselves before the Lord. The consecration part that you have done, you have given yourself unto the Lord. You have set yourself apart. And the Lord is beginning to do a new work. The new work is that He's going to miss, move us ahead. Somebody's phone is ringing. Let's not get distracted. As Pastor Lydia has shared the word, it is it's about Nehemiah. Because his heart is set upon God. His focus is on the Lord. So I want to challenge you this day that your focus, that our focus be also be on the Lord. Yes, we go through different life stage. We go through different challenges in life. But let us stay focused that Jesus be the centre. Can we say amen to that? Amen. I, I've seen quite a number of hands raised up. I believe, I believe, if only that we take the step of faith, as we continue to sing, let us, let us take this time, take forward. Let's spend some time t- together and say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Use me. Right? The altar is here. I see in my spirit the altar is here. The Lord is speaking, telling us that bring yourself as a living sacrifice unto the altar before me. That's where I will consume. I will consume what is of you that is a living sacrifice. We will do that. Those who have raised hand, I would just ask you to come. Say you have made you have made your 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 uh, uh, heart. You set your heart on the Lord. Just come as we continue to sing the song. Jesus be the center. Just come. Those who have raised hand, just come forward. Even those who have not raised their hand, you want you feel that you've been challenged. Let it not be an emotional decision. Let it not be emotional driven. But let it be a will of yours. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, come. Let's continue as we sing softly. Jesus be the center. Hallelujah. Because God is doing a mighty work. He's going to do mighty works among us. Yes, just raise your hand as we sing. Come on, let's sing this song. Jesus be the center. Just spend this moment before the Lord. Jesus be the center of my Yes. Jesus be the center of my life. Let me know the end. It will always be and always be you desire. Oh yes, Lord, we consecrate ourselves before Lord. Jesus be the center of my life From the beginning to the end It will always be, it will always be in you, Jesus Nothing else matters Nothing else matters Nothing in this world will do You're the center Everything revolves around you Jesus, you are the center of Oh, one more time, nothing else matters Nothing else matters And nothing in this world your hands stretch up and it's act of surrender I just sense the Lord is pleased with us because you are willing and you have set apart 
for the past five weeks, you have consecrated yourself, you have surrendered what that is not of, of His. And you laid it at the altar. And today, He Himself has placed this altar and the fire, the fire of God has consumed, begin to consume us. And with this, what it means is that the church is going to move forward for His glory. For His glory. We will not take the glory, but the glory belongs to Him. I'm going to begin to pray. Let's receive this. Hallelujah. Lord, You've seen every heart, man and woman, in this house. We know, oh God, that You have begun the new works since that you call us to consecrate ourselves. Nothing can hinder us and prevent us from moving forward with you as long as we are willing to serve you wholeheartedly. As long as we remain focused, we hear, Lord, that we are also reminded that we have an enemy that want to distract, deter, and also to the extent of destroy our purpose, our will in our life. But God, you have triumphed. You have triumphed. You have triumphed over Him. And you have given us the victory as Glad Tidings Church. And Lord, today, once again as a body of Christ, we just offer ourselves as a living sacrifice before this altar that you have laid before us. Lord, let it be a sweet aroma. Lord, you see every one of us here. Let it consume, consume us, Lord. Let it be a sweet, sweet aroma to you that we will please you in all that we do. And Lord, we're going to commit ourselves today once again as Glad Tidings Church. Hallelujah. Himarahatiki hebuku haileki mekerbatsi kiriando. Marahatu ki po bahai te ke bahai de ki parai di kianda. Morahatu ku pihi parando ko parai kianda rakai le ke po. Merahatu ko bahai le ke. Mohaka ke parakarai ke ramasan. Orakata ka rabasi ke ramabasi ko ramamasan. Orabaka da baka rababasi ke rianda rabasan da rakor rabaka rianda rabas. E marahatu ko robo ke pe kerando po. Mera bahu bahai le ke de ke dia. Morahatu ko ho bahai le ke rianda rabasan da rabasan da. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us take this seriously. I sense the Lord, this, the severity of this stand today, you, you stand before God. I just sense that he, when you mean business with Him, He will mean business with you. When you begin to take this step and He will move two steps ahead of you. And it is what He has going to promise us. We are going to move forward like the army of the Lord to declare His mercy, His grace, His love among, upon the communities because souls are precious. Souls are precious to the Lord. I believe He's going to unite us through His love. Through His love, He's going to unite us as one. We are going to function as one body, although there are different parts. Your gifting will be stirred. Your passion will be stirred. This is what I sense the Lord is telling us. He's going to be stirred as you give yourself unto the Lord in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you today. Lord, we want to honor you once again. Whatever our past that you have just bring it to pass, you just can't, you have bring it to it's over. We have crossed. We have crossed over to the Canaan's land. And we're gonna conquer and conquer and conquer. So we thank you for this day, Lord. Indeed, it's a day of victory, a day of deliverance. A day of promise, a day of provision for the church here. So we thank you. 
We ask you, Lord, as we draw close to each day, each time in prayer, let us all be dependent on Him through the work of the Holy Spirit that we will all stay together as one body, one lordship, one baptism, one spirit, and there is one He wants us to be. Would you just turn to someone to express the love of God that's going to flow through us? Would you just find someone and hold somebody's hand? Those behind also, you got just hold somebody's hand to be to feel the tangible presence of the love of God, the Father, that He's pouring out, even at this juncture. Yes, yes, just hold. Experience the love of the Lord, the warmth, the heat, the presence. The peace, the joy, that is the expression of His love. Hallelujah. Oh yes, thank you Lord. Yes, thank you. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, just enjoy His presence for a moment. Just enjoy His presence for a moment. Thank you. Thank you Lord. Thank you. Thank you Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you have made it all possible. You have made it all possible for each one of us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's give, let's give God the glory of the thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for He's about to do. Amen. Amen. Amen.